eighth doctor once remarked that humans are always seeing patterns in things that aren't there. And he was definitely talking about fan theories when he said that. By their nature, fan theories aren't always taken seriously. But some of them are so brilliant that it's easy to imagine them being cold hard canon. So with that in mind, I'm Ellie with Who Culture here with 10 Doctor Who fan theories that make too much sense to ignore. Number 10. The diner in The Impossible Astronaut is Clara's TARDIS. Hellbent aired in 2015, at a time when stateside interest in the show had never been greater. Which might be why Clara's TARDIS took the form of an American diner. And if we trace Doctor Who's big American boom back to the beginning, we find ourselves at Series 6 opener The Impossible Astronaut and Day of the Moon, the first story to feature principal photography in the States. Funnily enough, that story also features an American diner, one which looks suspiciously like Clara's. The boring behind the scenes explanation is that the same filming location was used in both instances, but it's not like the show ignores the similarity. Indeed, the doctor remarks that Clara's diner looks familiar to one he's been to before. The implication seems to be that Clara modelled her TARDIS on this diner, as opposed to them being one and the same, but it's not entirely beyond the realm of possibility. In fact, Clara could quite easily have moved her TARDIS from Nevada, where the Hellbent Diner is located, to Utah, where the Impossible Astronaut Diner is located. After all, it is a TARDIS. This would rather tantalisingly suggest that she was watching over the Doctor before they met and nudging him along just as Missy did for her. Number 9. Captain Jack manipulated Owen and Tosh into joining Torchwood In the Torchwood episode Fragments, we learn how Captain Jack became the head of Torchwood 3 and how he recruited Tosh, Yanto and Owen to join his team. And if a certain fan theory is to be believed, there might be more to these backstories than meets the eye. Prior to joining Torchwood, Tosh and Owen were both in a bad place. Tosh had unsuccessfully tried to free her mother from a hostage situation by stealing Ministry of Defence plans and subsequently found herself serving a life sentence in a unit prison. Owen, meanwhile, had lost his fiancée Katie to an alien parasite masquerading as a brain tumour. In both cases, Jack is presented as something of a saviour, seeing the potential in Tosh and Owen and offering them the second chance they clearly deserve. But could he have had a bigger role in proceedings than he lets on? Could he have been watching Tosh and Owen from even further back, manipulating events from the start to ensure they ended up working for him? If so, the possibilities are endless. He could have been the one who tipped off Unit about Tosh, or who planted the parasite in Katie's brain. Jack's done some pretty sketchy stuff before, see Adrift and Children of Earth, so it wouldn't be completely out of character. Number 8. The original adjudicator was a division doctor. Thanks to the timeless children, the so-called Morbius doctors, that is, the faces seen in the 1976 serial The Brain of Morbius, implied to be pre-Hartnell doctors, have enjoyed a bit of a renaissance in recent years. As part of that renaissance, a fascinating quirk of production has come to light, one which lays the foundations for a rather brilliant fan theory. The Morbius Doctors were, in reality, various crew members who were working on the show at the time. Seven of the eight photos used were taken specifically for the brain of Morbius, but one was not. Five years earlier, in the third Doctor serial Colony in Space, the Master impersonated an adjudicator in a bid to take control of the Doomsday Weapon. The original adjudicator never appeared on screen, but his photo did, a photo that was later used to represent one of the Morbius Doctors. At the time, it's unlikely that the production team would have given this a second thought, but if you join the dots, there's a possibility that the original adjudicator was the Doctor all along on some shady division mission concerning the Doomsday Weapon, which you can't deny is a pretty great prospect. Number 7. Series 7A takes place in a different order for the Doctor. I'm not running away from things, the Doctor tells Amy in The Power of Three. I'm running to them before they flare and fade forever. One day, soon maybe, you'll stop, he continues. I've known for a while. In context, this conversation makes perfect sense. The Power of Three is the Pond's penultimate adventure, and over the course of the last three stories, we've seen them become increasingly independent from the Doctor, to the point where they're now only travelling with him part-time. But what if the Doctor knew more than he was letting on? What if, from his perspective, he'd already parted ways with the Pond's? One theory suggests that this is exactly the case with the whole of Series 7A taking place in a different order for the Doctor. The order of Episodes 1-4 to four is disputed, but the key thing is that the Angels Take Manhattan occurs first, with a distraught Doctor travelling back in time, River Song style, to enjoy further adventures with his best friends while they're still alive. It's a bold theory, and one that, if true, gives that line I've known for a while a whole new meaning. Number 6. The shopkeeper in the Sarah Jane Adventures was the Corsair. Elizabeth Sladen's untimely passing 
left the Sarah Jane Adventures with a shortened final series and lots of loose ends. Chief among these was the identity of the mysterious shopkeeper introduced in Series 4's Lost in Time, and seen again in Series 5 opener Sky, a self-professed servant of the universe together with his parrot companion, Captain. Had Series 5 of the Sarah Jane Adventures been completed, we would have discovered that the shopkeeper was an unwitting pawn in a scheme engineered by the trickster. But as things stand, fans have been left to fill in the gaps, and one particular theory has gained quite a bit of traction. For his debut Doctor Who episode, The Doctor's Wife, Neil Gaiman created the character of the Corsair, a riotous, swashbuckling Time Lord slash Lady who was an old acquaintance of the Doctor. In a book feature later that year titled 11 Things You Probably Didn't Know About the Corsair, Gaiman revealed that one of the Corsair's incarnations had a parrot, and one of the illustrations that accompanied the feature showed said parrot resting on a dark-skinned hand. Hmm. What's more, the shopkeeper's actor briefly returned to the Hooniverse in 2016 to play Class's Chair of the Governors, another mysterious character. Was he also the shopkeeper and or Corsair? It's tempting to think so. Number 5. Why Sarah Jane Smith wasn't allowed on Gallifrey It's always difficult to come up with good reasons for companions to depart. After all, if you were offered the chance to travel in all of time and space, would you be able to give it up? In the case of fan favourite Sarah Jane Smith, the production team came up with the contrivance that the Doctor had been summoned back to Gallifrey where Sarah Jane wasn't allowed. Looking back, it's a pretty lame excuse, and even if we do take it at face value, there's no reason why the Doctor couldn't have gone back for Sarah Jane once his business on Gallifrey was complete. There is, however, another more palatable explanation, that the Doctor was lying. And no, we don't mean that he was deliberately trying to get Sarah Jane out of the way, though Tom Baker was keen to do a story without a companion. On the contrary, he was trying to protect her from the Time Lords, who had, by this point, put him on trial, forced him to regenerate, exiled him to Earth, and perhaps most significantly, erase the memories of two of his past companions. From that perspective, it's totally understandable why the Doctor would want to keep his best friend as far away from his people as possible. Number 4. River Song Has Met The 14th Doctor River Song has met almost all of the Doctor's incarnations, and this should come as no surprise. After all, she is their wife. But the husbands of River Song, her final story to date, would seem to suggest that there's a limit to the number of Doctor's Doctors she can actually encounter. In that story, she appears to have no knowledge of the Twelfth Doctor, or the Doctor's second regeneration cycle more broadly, claiming that the only faces the Doctor had were the Twelve we'd seen prior to Capaldi. Does this mean she can't conceivably meet any Doctor post-12? Perhaps. But according to one theory, she already has. In River's first story, she tells the Tenth Doctor that he's younger than she's ever seen him. In context, she means she's never seen the Doctor this young full stop, but in light of David Tennant's return as the 14th, Doctor, her remark could just as easily refer to that specific face. To put it another way, it's entirely possible that River has encountered the 14th Doctor without even realising that he's not the 10th. Indeed, for all we know, a 14 River team up is already on the cards. Yes, please! And if not, Big Finish will no doubt get around to it at some point. Number 3. The first Doctor had a sonic screwdriver. The sonic screwdriver didn't become part of Doctor Who until the second Doctor's era. But what if it actually goes back further than that. In stories such as The Edge of Destruction, the first Doctor is seen to own a small pen light. He doesn't refer to it as a sonic screwdriver, but the resemblance to the pen light sonic used by the second Doctor suggests that it could be an early model. The 1994 Virgin Missing Adventures novel, Venusian Lullaby, which makes reference to an unknown sonic device deployed by the first Doctor, lends further credence to the idea. There's certainly nothing to say the Doctor didn't own a sonic in his first incarnation, but if he did, why didn't he use it more widely on screen. Well, it's entirely possible that he simply hadn't grasped its full range of functions yet, like a grandparent who has a smartphone but only uses it to send texts. If we stick with this theory, the Doctor took the time to properly get to grips with his trendy new toy sometime prior to Fury from the Deep, and the rest is history. Number 2. The Time Lords weaponized regenerations during the Time War Regeneration is one of the many things that got a makeover when Doctor Who returned to our screens in 2005. In Classic Who, every Doctor regenerated lying down down and the effect was much more subdued. By contrast, every new Who Doctor to date has regenerated standing up in a majestic outstretched pose and the process has been presented as much more explosive, with golden energy bursting out of their hands and head. The behind the scenes rationale is clear. With bigger budgets, it's possible to do much more impressive regeneration effects. But how can we make sense of this drastic change in universe? Well, as with many discrepancies between classic and modern Doctor Who, the Time War is our friend. Regeneration has always been a rare and 
powerful phenomenon, and recent developments with the Timeless Child have only affirmed this. So what if, in their war against the Daleks, the Time Lord saw an opportunity to harness this power into something more destructive? This would explain why the Doctor's regenerations have been much more volatile recently. If a Time Lord dies during the Time War, well, at least they might be able to take one or two Daleks with them. Number 1. The Chameleon Circuit isn't completely broken Although the TARDIS has been stuck looking like a police box all these years, it hasn't remained completely unchanged. In fact, there have been multiple cosmetic changes to the ship's exterior since it first left Earth in 1963. It's been various shades of blue and various sizes. The new series TARDISes have on the whole been much bulkier than their classic counterparts. The windows and signs have changed colour and the roof lamp has been replaced countless times. From a production perspective, it's understandable why you'd want to give the TARDIS a bit of a refresh every few years. But in the actual show, isn't the chameleon circuit, the mechanism that changes the TARDIS's appearance to blend in with its surroundings broken? Well, sort of. All we've really been told is that the chameleon circuit is stuck in police box mode, but there's nothing to say it can't function within that parameter. Basically, the chameleon circuit is broken in that it can't switch from its police box form, but it can still make minor alterations to that form. If true, this would be a satisfying explanation for why the TARDIS exterior has changed so much over time. Also, the Doctor Donna told the Doctor how to fix it, so at this point I think he just likes the police box. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed something, then do let us know in the comments below, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe, and tap that notification bell so you never miss a Who Culture video ever again. Also head over to Twitter and Instagram and TikTok to follow us there, and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with Who Culture, and in the words of River Song herself, goodbye, sweeties.